Thank you for looking up our presentation this evening on oncologic emergencies. This is pre-recorded, but I should be available at the end to discuss questions or comments, or perhaps some cases of yours, if time and my IT skills allow. We will go through the following list of emergency presentations, noting that some oncology emergencies are not included, such as, for example, dyspnea, um, as the general approach to such a problem often does not compromise ongoing cancer care when neoplasia is the ultimate diagnosis. So starting with the hypercalcemia of malignancy. The next two slides are a reminder of calcium homeostasis, which is relevant to how and how well we can control this problem. Uh, most calcium is in the intracellular space, and of that in the extracellular space, about 10% is complex, about 35% is protein bound, especially to albumin, and therefore changes in albumin concentration can affect total calcium a lot. Um, and the final portion, in which we are most interested is the ionized calcium, which is a functional portion. It is possible to have a mild to moderate ionized hypercalcemia within a total, often top end of normal, total calcium concentration. So especially with the greater availability of point of care analyzers, um, the value of using formulae to correct calcium is highly questionable. And if you have concerns about calcium disorder, using the ionized calcium is the most robust approach. In terms of regulation and dysregulation, parathyroid hormone is primarily stimulated by a decrease in ionized calcium concentration, which in turn raises calcium concentration through decreased calciuresis and increased leaching of calcium from bone, as well as activating calcitriol, which negatively feeds back on parathyroid hormone production. But calcitriol also increases gastrointestinal absorption of calcium through a long lived protein and decreases calciuresis to increase the ionized calcium concentration back to where it should be. Opposing these factors is calcitonin, which is mainly activated through an increased ionized calcium concentration, causing decreased bone leaching and increased calciuresis. One additional factor which is significant here is PTHRP, or parathyroid hormone-related peptide, as it is similar to parathyroid hormone and could cause the underlined effects in common. However, other cytokines can influence the system and cause hypercalcemia with a negative PTHRP assay result, such as IL-1, IL-6, uh, TNF, nuclear factor kappa beta, TGF, prostaglandins, and RANCL. Therefore, a negative PTHRP result does not absolutely rule out a neoplasm is behind the hypercalcemia. Coming on to the clinical signs of hypercalcemia, these vary between species and this slide is mainly based on dogs, in which there may be no clinical signs, especially if there is an underlying primary hyperparathyroidism, as we will discuss further later, or perhaps just general lethargy and weakness. Calcium interferes with the function of antidiuretic hormone, and so there is a primary polyuria with a compensatory polydipsia, and also poor sodium and calcium reabsorption in the urinary tubules, and so dehydration often follows. And sometimes this is followed by calcium-based urolithiasis in the urinary spaces and ultimately renal failure with underlying vasoconstriction, hypovolemia, mineralization, and perhaps urinary tract infection within the kidneys. Neurological signs are perhaps not just due to alterations in membrane excitability, but also possibly microthrombi within the central nervous system. Gastrointestinal signs include inaptance, vomiting, and are sometimes associated with renal issues, um, or hypergastronemia, and especially constipation due to chronic muscular weakness. There are also some effects on electrocardiograms, um, and the gastrointestinal signs are dominant in cats, um, although we know uh, problems are also not infrequent. The ultrasound here is of a parathyroid module. The severity of the presentation indicates the necessary urgency of our response. It's not all to do with the magnitude of the ionized hypercalcemia, although that's a major factor. It also depends on the duration of hypercalcemia, the rate of change. Acidosis, for example, shifts other stores of calcium to the ionized component and so magnifies the problem. But the threat of progression and decompensation is present even in very mildly affected patients. Many authors concentrate on the calcium times phosphorus product as to the risk of tissue mineralization. Onto our huge array of differentials with two major mnemonics in widespread use. Here is Gosh Darn It. And here is Hardines. 
However, in terms of raising the priority or frequency, malignancy accounts for at least half of hypercalcemia cases in dogs with kidney disease, um, hypogenocorticism, and primary hyperparathyroidism, making up the majority of the other cases. In cats, only about 30% of cases are neoplastic, with more cases affected by renal failure and a similar number of cases being idiopathic in nature. For renal failure patients, most cases have normal or low normal total calcium concentrations with increased uh, concentrations of organic cat, uh, anions in the system complexing with calcium. About 20% of dogs and cats with chronic renal failure have a total hypercalcemia, and about 10% of dogs and 30% of cats with chronic renal failure have an ionized hypercalcemia. But this is an oncology discussion, and so here is the still large list of neoplastic causes of hypercalcemia. Um, it's dominated by T-cell lymphoma or lymphoproliferative disorders, but also some B-cell disorders, including multiple myeloma, um, apocrine gland adenocarcinoma, and several that you can see here. Um, all carcinomas carry a small risk of cytokine production, so any carcinoma can cause hypercalcemia of malignancy, and the list goes on with a very small risk and several other tumour types which have made up case reports over the years. Um, this picture is of a kitten's chest with a massive cranial mediastinal mass. And so to the investigation of suspicious cases, which might be influenced by hints from the signalment, such as keys hands and hyperparathyroidism, or boxers and T-cell lymphoma, but also hints from the history, such as being presented by a flaky skinned owner who can't find their psoriasis cream, or hints from the physical examination, such as lameness with bone tumours or a perineal mass with amyl gland adenocarcinoma. In general, however, the ionised calcium should be taken to try and confirm the diagnosis, usually coming with all the other electrolytes. Overall, a minimum day space is invaluable, um, although the urinalysis is often the last on the list to be performed, um, ideally with a sediment exam for completeness, looking for calcium-containing crystals. I also occasionally do an ECG if suggested by the physical examination with arrhythmia um, being found, or if the calcium concentration is massive and yet the patient is not very decompensated as an early warning um, of cardiac issues. It's also useful to document the improvement on therapy. It is usually straight onto therapy once the hypercalcemia is documented while running further investigations such as imaging. And so very many forms of imaging studies are indicated here. Some form of imaging of the chest and abdomen is absolutely indicated, and beyond the routine bicavity imaging, it can also be useful to image the mediastinum for masses, the laryngeal area for the parathyroids, and perhaps a CT scan of the pelvis for sacral lymph node enlargement, as some anal gland adenocarcinoma primary masses can be very small with impressively large lymph node metastatic lesions. Often we have a strong suspicion of the etiology by integration of the imaging, clinical pathological and clinical data ruling in and out several problems and narrowing the differential list. Confirmation of testing uh, varies with your suspicion, but in many cases we'll be, we will be looking at um, a neoplastic diagnosis by cytology biopsy or flow cytometry of a lymphoid organ sample. One neoplastic diagnosis in particular is primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, some colleagues expect parathyroid hormone concentration to be high in every primary hyperparathyroidism case. Um, but when ionized calcium concentration is high, the only appropriate concentration um, of parathyroid hormone is a low one. So even a reference range parathyroid hormone concentration is abnormal when ionized calcium concentration is high. If the rest of the investigations were negative, an occult neoplasm might be revealed through evaluation of parathyroid hormone related peptides, acknowledging that there are other cytokines through which this can happen. A diagnosis by exclusion is sometimes necessary for some of the more rare differentials or fleeting conditions, and it can be very difficult to robustly establish the diagnosis through a, ther through a therapeutic trial. The main layer of therapy is intravenous fluid therapy. The race and type of fluids is determined by the status of the patient and their initial response to therapy. Um, in most fluids, the amount of calcium within is trivial by comparison, um, and, but ideally a calcium-free fluid would be given looking for a mild volume expansion, which induces diuresis and a mild calciuresis as the sodium is preferentially reabsorbed into the bloodstream. Given the symptomatic nature of the condition, it's often necessary to factor in other losses uh, beyond polyuria so that there is initial and ongoing reversal of azotemia verified by creatinine, BUM, uh, and other parameters such as PCB total solids, electrolytes, and other biochemistry parameters at least twice daily. A maintenance solution such as Hastron saline 
um, is often a major fluid after resuscitation to avoid fluid and especially sodium overload in the longer term, which is particularly important in all the uric patients, as most patients should have had at least one to two milliliters of urine per kilo per hour being produced on such brisk intravenous fluid therapy. But what if this is not enough to control your patient's calcium? The next most common step is furosemide, either intermittently or constant weight infusion, um, with a mild benefit in constant infusions over intermittent dosing. Thiazides are an inappropriate choice, um, and furosemide is usually such an effective option in the medium term while the investigation is completed. For the very um, unresponsive cases, at the stated dose, calcitonin promptly inhibits osteoclast but can subsequently become ineffective as osteoclasts can resist repeat doses by downregulating their receptors. Calcitonin and the previous measures are so effective that I have rarely ever felt the need to use sodium bicarbonate uh, for emergency therapy to increase the pH, increase calcium binding to albumin and promote calciuresis. But there are some serious side effects of this approach which does not suffer from exhaustion the way calcitonin use does. But why bother taking these risks uh, with side effects when glucocorticoids such as prednisolone can be so effective at comprehensively decreasing ionized calcium directly and through indirect mechanisms such as a lympholytic effect in the case of lymphoma patients? It's absolutely the correct treatment for hypodrenic hypo cortisol and is an effective therapy for many other differentials. However, it's a very wrong therapy for infectious diseases, and we would ideally only reach for glucocorticoids once the diagnosis has been robustly established. Because it is a quite comprehensive therapy for several differentials, it makes for a poorly specific clinical trial in trying to establish a single diagnosis. Just a couple more therapeutic slides, as the bisosinates are worth a mention, but they're not really emergency therapy. Uh, these drugs incorporate themselves into hydroxyapatite crystals in areas of active bone turnover and then are ingested by osteoclasts, interfering with ATP production, which downgrades osteoclast function and perhaps even kills the cells within one to five days. Later the later generation of drugs aminobisphosphonates are much more powerful and much longer acting. Uh, there is a risk of renal damage and of electrolyte imbalances, but this seems quite rare especially if there is well hydration, um, even in the acetemic patients. The combination of salmon for very prompt and ultra short term calcium control, while either tablet or infusion bisphosphonate gets to work more durably, is often a very winning combination for stabilization of these patients until definitive therapy starts. In the longer term, a dietary change might be helpful, but clearly we're hoping that after stabilizing the patient and establishing a definitive diagnosis, definitive treatment will follow with best success. One last slide on primary hyperparathyroidism, which is often clinically silent, even though the level of hypercalcemia is massive, um, other than the urine being full of calcium and therefore being prone to stone formation. Um, most commonly, this is formed by adenomas, but carcinomas are reported. Um, and hyperplasia can occur in more than one gland, which often gives rise to confusing imaging results rather than just a classical one out of four glands being large. This sometimes results in the need to sequentially remove the enlarged glands one by one and then subsequently assess the effect of um, control of the hypercalcemia before removing the next gland that's most suspicious. Our next section is on sepsis. Occasionally there is neutropenia at presentation, but sepsis is uncommon before treatment. Um, such neutropenia can happen with myelophthesis and leukemia, perhaps with more than just the neutrophils being suppressed either directly or indirectly. Sadly, such neutropenia cases will only have resolution from their tumours um, after chemotherapy, and starting chemotherapy while already neutropenic makes them at high risk for a later sepsis. Most patients with sepsis um, are going to be presented after chemotherapy, uh, either three to five days later or around the time of the neutrophil nadir for the particular drug used. However, always bear in mind that any sepsis or other comorbidity might just be a comorbidity in an otherwise complication-free chemotherapy patient. The risk of post-chemotherapy sepsis is actually quite low. In general, there are less than 5% significant adverse events with less than half of 1% fatal adverse events in chemotherapy-treated patients. 
Although most endures are predictable for most of our drugs, some um, are less predictable, such as lamustine, which can have a bifid uh, nadir and be very unpredictable. Uh, most nadirs are also brief, um, giving only two or three days of suppression. Sometimes we'll see uh, the platelets come back uh, first because they have a quicker generation time, and so a hemogram might suggest imminent recovery of the uh, neutrophils is pending. The most common effect of having uh, myelin suppression is uh, subsequent chemotherapeutic delay. The risk of significant complications like sepsis post chemotherapy is worse in patients who are small and obese due to the way in which um, drugs are calculated in doses per meter squared. Um, and also seen more in lymphoma patients, primarily with doxorubicin, although vincristine is uh, shown to be predisposed in some studies. Also patients with significant comorbidities, uh, poor nutrition, and those which are inpatient. For those patients with subclinical neutropenia, um, if the neutropenia is very trifling, such as above 1.5, but below the reference range, and then the patient is monitored and even stays on schedule with their chemotherapy protocol, with a lower neutrophil count, a dose delay and a dose reduction of the previous drug are, is needed for the future doses. I personally do not use prophylactic antibiotics in this scenario. However, depending on the author you quote, even when subclinical antibiotics such as trimethoprimosulfonamides or potentiacetamoxicillin or perhaps even fluoroquinolones are indicated once the neutrophil count is below 0 0.75. These patients can often be managed without patients as long as they are well, with some extra monitoring at home, perhaps temperature taking a few times a day. It's worth pointing out that when the neutrophil count is so low, the amount of cytokines generated by inflammation can sometimes be insufficient to cause a fever, so a holistic assessment is better than concentrating on the temperature alone. It is best to avoid hospital-acquired infections and for the, for the healthy and uh, well patients to go home. However, a planned revisit within a few days at the expected time of recovery is a good option, especially for owners who might not be so conscientious. Once clinical, the neutropenic patient is usually regarded as septic, regardless of whether they present febrile or hypothermic, bradycardic or tachycardic. There may be some signs frequently encountered post chemotherapy, such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, but these might also reflect more serious signs of translocation across the gut being one uh, major portal of infection entry, but also not excluding the lungs, skin, and urinary tract. Even if mild clinical signs are present, the patient can deteriorate very quickly once compensatory mechanisms are stretched, and so these should always be considered genuine emergencies. Reflecting this on the physical exam, the patient might be caught as a compensated state before uh, decompensation into shock um, develops. Um, we always look thoroughly for an obvious site of a local infection site, such as uh, the gastrointestinal tract, urinary tract, lung, and skin. For initial investigation, it's essential to do a hematology with a manual smear looking for toxic changes and also to help with any machine errors, uh, which often happen when counts are abnormally low. A biochemistry panel is also essential, uh, with some people using serial glucose or lactate concentrations to infer the effectiveness of therapy, or perhaps when effusions are present, a differential serum versus effusion glucose or lactate to infer the likelihood of a localised infection such as septic peritonitis. A coagulation panel can be useful to disclose the disseminated intravascular coagulation. Um, a lack of sufficient white blood cells might not just cause fever to be absent where it otherwise would normally be present, but also cause a lack of a reactive urinary sediment or even an unremarkable chest X-ray despite significant infections being underway. Therefore, a culture is ideal to rule out an infection, which is relatively easy from sites on the skin, such as around the cannula um, or from the urinary tract, but I have always found transtracheal washes very poorly tolerated by patients with perhaps a lung infection. If left untreated, then we'll have further pro-inflammatory mediators leading to inflammatory cell infiltration, altered thermoregulation, vasodilation, vascular leakage, perhaps coagulation and poor perfusion, leading to hypoxia and dysfunction of mitochondria in several organs. This can cause apoptosis and lead to a greater immune response in a vicious circle in which we get irreversible failure in multiple organs. So how do we avoid such a downward spiral? 
Um, it is possible to be preemptive, uh, perhaps if we prime owners of patients with several risk factors to be extra vigilant and not to waste any time in reporting even mild clinical signs. Once admitted, the patient needs to have an aseptically placed uh, cannula for venous access, which is well maintained, and immediately given boluses, we have perhaps up to 5 of 20 milligrams per kilogram IV crystalloids for dogs and 3 of those boluses for cats um, to stabilise blood pressure. Um, if crystalloids are not effective, some authors would use colloids, maybe 5 mls per kilo for dogs and 2 mls per kilo for cats, but generally to effect, or perhaps 2 to 4 mls per kilo of hypertonic saline. If anemia is a significant finding, then perhaps a blood product to raise the hematocrit quick to about 25% or higher would be ideal. And usually there would be stability in the blood pressure um, with a mean arterial pressure of at least 65 millimeters of mercury um, within a few hours, maybe up to six hours. Um, normally we would see good urine output of at least 0.5 mils per kilo per hour, and this would be maintained with tailored fluid therapy thereafter. Such a high volume resuscitation approach is useful for most conditions. However, if hemorrhage or ruptured viscous is suspected, then maybe a low volume approach relying more on colleagues and lower target blood pressure would be useful. During resuscitation, the patient is generally given um, intravenous doses of uh, a beta lactam antibiotic, a fluoroquinolone, and perhaps um, an anaerobic uh, antibiotic. The patient is also often suffering from uh, gastrointestinal effects such as nauseation, and so will probably need more opotent dietary support and maybe antidiarrheals such as salicylate clay and procolon and other clay based treatments for diarrhea, which adsorb bacterial enterotoxins and increase the reabsorption of intraluminal water in the gastrointestinal tract. If the blood pressure is hard to control, some people would use pressures next. Um, and some would often reach for dexamethasone early to try and limit the ongoing immune system hyperactivity or perhaps to combat a relative adrenal insufficiency. A commonly stimulating factor um, is rarely needed in the emergency setting as the patient has probably made enough of their own um, as to be superfluous, but it might be useful to preempt future sepsis in a patient that has just been overdosed with chemotherapy inadvertently but not during the emergency presentation thereafter. A lot depends on where um, your training might have been, as research is patchy in this scenario and so practice is often habit-based. But the typical patient usually rallies within one or two days, going home after downstaging of their original therapy and having future doses of chemotherapy reduced to avoid repeat sepsis. That is hopefully if the patient, or the client rather, has not already lost all enthusiasm for chemotherapy. Going back to the first slide of this sepsis section, um, if you are starting chemotherapy in a patient who's already neutropenic, then some treatments might be emphasized due to their lesser neutropenic effect, uh, but these are often quite weak drugs overall, such as l or chlorambucil, and it's often necessary to go with admittedly more profoundly suppressive drugs, such as doxorubicin or lamustine or vincristine, uh, perhaps as a slightly reduced dose initially. Moving on to the hyperviscosity syndromes. Hyperviscosity is due to increased intravenous viscosity and can be either caused by an excessive number of cells, um, with each of the lineages possibly being at fault, or possibly uh, due to excessive plasma proteins, either with a monoclonal or a polyclonal gammopathy. Uh, the patient pictured has a hyperviscosity syndrome, uh, which is affecting selected vessels, decreasing perfusion which reflects many of the clinical signs seen in our patients. Hyperviscosity syndromes can cause coagulation disorders through multiple interacting mechanisms, including, including thrombocytopenia if the marrow is compromised, but also thrombocytopathia with poor access to and function of platelets with coagulation factors. Often there's separate interference with coagulation cascades, really resulting in bleeding problems, some of which might be occult initially. Poor circulation in uh, the smallest capillaries can often affect the central nervous system, resulting in poor cognition, ataxia, and perhaps even more serious side effects. Similarly, the owner might report visual disturbances, or when these are subclinical, we might see severe vascular problems on fundoscopic examination. There may be a novel murmur and perhaps some hypertension. Uh, increasing the load on the cardiovascular system. And the renal system can suffer with poor perfusion as other organs, but also with gammopathies, 
um, which can cause amyloidosis or form casts in the urinary tubules as a direct result. Overall, the hyperviscous patient presents with a wide range of clinical signs and systems potentially affected and would have to have a high index of clinical suspicion to reach diagnosis. Thankfully, a minimum database often promptly gives us a direction to follow. On this slide, for example, excessive protein-based hyperviscous syndromes. Historically, we used to have a diagnosis of multiple myeloma when two of the four following signs were found, monoclonal gammopathy, punched out skeletal lesions, dense joints proteins, and excessive plasma cells in the bone marrow. More recent research would place a greater weight with the revelation of plasma cells in excess in the bone marrow or any imaging lesion, especially in the spleen. Finally, in dogs and cats, we can easily rule out um, non-monoclonal gammopathies, such as a polyclonal FIP or tick-borne serology. To pursue a case with erythrocytosis, we are essentially looking for any poor lung or cardiac function which might cause global hypoxemia. Other differentials for secondary erythrocytosis include a localized renal lesion causing localized hypoxemia, such as renal carcinoma, renal lymphoma, or other renal tumors, which might give us an increased concentration of ethoperitin being produced due to the local renal effects. Occasionally, there is ectopic production of erythropoietin outside of the kidney um, or an erythropoietin-like substance, such as with nasal tumors, fibrosarcomas, pheochromocytomas, or even fecal myosarcomas. All of these would be considered secondary erythrocytoses, and ruling out all such causes and showing abnormalities in the bone marrow would confirm a diagnosis of primary erythrocytosis. When the minimum database uh, reveals a profound leukocytosis, traditionally we have done much staging with hematology, uh, imaging studies, uh, and lymph node cytology to see if there is an underlying lymphoma, perhaps with overspill into the circulation. Such an approach is less relevant when there is no evidence of organomegaly or lymph node enlargement, and there is a massive leukocytosis, suggesting that the patient is leukemic rather than have an overspill. Increasingly, we are using flow cytometry and the detailed information within as a more reliable uh, way to diagnose the leukocytosis problems. This is because it is well established that morphological assessment of blood smears and bone marrow has its limitations, and previously morphologically assessed uh, leukocytosis of one lineage um, are often reclassified as truly being of a different lineage following flow cytometry. Finally, for lymphoid malignancies, a power analysis is the ideal way to confirm clonality if this is necessary. With regard to therapy, the emergency solution is, the solution is to sample the blood and ideally return the non-problematic fraction of the blood to the patient if the local facilities allow, although this is not essential for initial success. This might risk anemia in cases of hyperviscosity syndrome due to a gammopathy, or in cases of a cell-based hyperviscosity syndrome, it risks hypoalbuminemia. Therefore, hopefully, in the medium to longer term, rather than have chronic repeat of phlebotomy, a definitive diagnosis would lead to definitive treatment and better control. I've squeezed in the acute tumor lysis syndrome here because it's sometimes seen in patients with hyperviscosity syndrome due to a massive leukemia. Um, this is a bit of a unicorn of a disease, and I'm not entirely convinced that I've seen a genuine case, um, but I've always tried to take precautions and preemptive action when I've suspected there might be a case to try and minimise its development. The classical background to acute tumor lysis syndrome um, is one of a large burden of very chemosensitive cells or radiation therapy sensitive cells, which um, undergo a massive death shortly after treatment. Uh, resulting in overloading of internal metabolism and metabolic derangement. With lots of intracellular content suddenly becoming extracellular, some metabolic alterations are hard to differentiate from sepsis. Aside from the classical scenario, acute tumor lysis syndrome has been reported in some cases of surgery with hemangiosarcoma and even intestinal adenocarcinoma. A common finding is hyperkalemia, resulting in bradycardia, syncope and arrhythmias, as well as weakness and lethargy. Hyperphosphatemia is another common finding with subsequent hypocalcemia, perhaps lactic acidosis, 
And although hyperuricemia is very common in people, um, as dogs have hepatic uricase in most species other than Dalmatians and English Bulldogs, this tends to be a less common finding in our species. So in patients with a classical presentation, perhaps such a sudden clinical deterioration is anticipatable, if that's a word, um, and can be differentiated from sepsis, um, as it's even more perocution at the presentation typically. Early rec recognition and treatment can produce a good outcome, um, and with preemption, perhaps in a patient with a classical acute lymphocytic leukemia presentation with uh, a very high lymphocyte count, I might initially reduce the chemotherapy intensity by reducing the dose, or say perhaps stagger typically synchronous induction agents. Um, I personally prefer to send my patients home, but there are cases which have been such classical um, patients for acute tumor lysis syndrome, but they have been hospitalized and had fluid therapy during their induction with biochemical and ECG monitoring to make sure that they didn't tip over into the syndrome. So people even go as far as giving allopurinol to deal with the purines, um, but there are also side effects from that drug, so I've tended to st uh, stay away from that so far. For cases in which the diagnosis is recognized, um, given the lack of routine success with standard approaches, it may be best to send the patient for dialysis once the diagnosis is made. Typical treatment includes calcium gluconase to protect the heart from the ECG changes induced by hyperkalemia, followed by directly controlling the uh, potassium concentration through the use of fruzamide, either by intermittent injection or constant rate infusion, uh, then perhaps insulin and glucose combinations, and perhaps yeah, by carbonate or the use of inhalant medication especially where there might be tremors. Um, beyond calcium gluconate in the acute scenario, maybe elemental calcium would be useful for hypercalcemic patients. With the more routine use of bicarbonate for metabolic acidosis and dietary phosphate binders. If the patient is a, a uricase deficient breed, then allopurinol might also be useful. But as I mentioned initially, perhaps it's worthwhile admitting that the uh, prognosis is very poor and opting for dialysis early. Moving on to our next uh, section devoted to pre syndrome. This is a much more frequently recognized presentation in which the retropharyngeal, cranial mediastinal, or other lymph nodes encircle the local structures, including the airway, esophagus, and large vessels. And so over time, these patients develop head, neck, and forelimb edema without hind limb edema, uh, dys dysphagia, dysphonia, and ultimately dyspnea. Although many cases will have a generalized lymphadenomegaly and be screaming lymphoma from the um, initial presentation, um, sometimes it's largely mediastinal and can be a bit more um, occult. Those lymphoma cases affected by pre syndrome have several negative prognostic indicators, including being substage B or clinically affected, having mediastinal involvement of the lymphoma, which frequently leads to a T-cell phenotype and a diagnosis of um, hypercalcemia, but B-cell neoplasms are not excluded from causing pre syndrome. However, we can still look forward to the majority of patients responding, at least initially, due to the sensitivity of the clones within um, such a pre syndrome. Um, typically, we use combination chemotherapy, um, Although an augmentation of a typical induction protocol by the use of l has somewhat fallen into favour in recent studies in which it neither hastened the remission promptness nor prolonged the remission duration. Furthermore, it decreases the options for um, relapse treatment in the future, but it is still something that is frequently done, perhaps somewhat out of habit. I more commonly um, use a CHOP protocol and move the um, individual doses about. And so rather than save the doxorubicin for week four, I move that to week one commonly in B cell lymphomas, which are causing pre syndrome, as doxorubicin is the most effective single agent. For chemotherapy resistant cases, or perhaps for T cell lymphomas, these can also be irradiated. And an effective um, anti lymphoma dose of radiation therapy can usually safely be given despite inclusion of much of the throat or mediastinum due to the neighboring structures being not so sensitive to radiation therapy in the short term. Sometimes these patients have a very large burden of disease in their lymph nodes and are at risk of developing acute tumor lysis syndrome. Um, and I've only ever in my career had to use a tracheostomy in one such patient. <laughs>
on to our second last um, category of the evening, which is for mass or tumor degranulation. Whether localized or systemic in nature, degranulation reactions are generally viewed as negative prognostic indicators based on the historical research. And the manifestations of cytokine activity disseminated throughout the body might not actually be consistent with the dissemination of the cells per se, um, and therefore widespread free metastasis doesn't always follow. We can also get localized um, degranulation reactions often referred to as a Darrie sign. The clinical signs based on histamine and similar amines being released include edema, perhaps hyperacidity and vomition, often leading to hematolysis and melina. Some authors recommend all pre-surgical patients which, with a large mass of tumour in situ should have antihistamines before surgery in case of degranulation due to physical stimulation. Um, I tend not to do that unless there's already some local evidence of degranulation, um, although I do have routine antihistamine treatment in my feline patients pre-surgery. Other than antihistamines, we can perhaps use prednisolone, which is a great membrane stabilizer, stabilizer for mast cells, but might also promote the ulceration, which can be problematic and might give us a very favorable and uh, misguided impression of both the stage and the margin status of our mast cell tumors after treatment. Coagulopathy is also an issue um, with the release of heparin and other vasoactive amines. And even if there is no detectable systemic coagulopathy on pre-surgical coag testing, there is often a localized coagulopathy um, in the surgical field, similar to hemangiosarcoma patients. This can lead to surgical complications. And although I've never had access to this drug, um, proteinine sulfate will terminate heparin activity and can be used under such circumstances, being more specific than the use of prednisolone. Finally, a couple of matters um, in this miscellaneous category to finish. So I wanted to talk a little bit about extravasation, even though um, I've been lucky enough not to have an extravasation per se. I did have some equipment fail and chemotherapy leaked on top of the patient rather than into the patient. Um, but I have seen the aftermath of some extravasations from colleagues who've also been very conscientious. Um, sadly, this not, and um, we can prevent every single extravasation case, uh, such as those due to equipment failure, but there's a lot that we can do to try and minimize the risk. So we have to make sure that we're on our top game when we're giving chemotherapy, with everybody in the room being adequately trained and ideally familiar, um, using a room in the hospital which is um, free from interruptions and not being used as a corridor. Ideally, we would know the patient and have adequate physical and or chemical restraint um, and for my canine patients who are a bit anxious, I'm often using trazodone or Xanax um, administered at home before they come in with gabapentin for the cats. The cannulation would ideally be done on a first stick basis with no repeat venipuncture um, and then flushed well with no concerns over probable leakage. Um, the vein used would hopefully be rotated from week to week in sequential protocols, each time recording um, which vein was used. We mainly worry about anthracycline extravasation, and for me, I don't personally feel safe giving an anthracycline um, unless we have the antidote desrazoxane in stock and that that stock is within date. There may be some clues during an extravasation um, if there's any increased resistance to the infusion that's being given. And this can be tested somewhat safely during um, the infusion by elevating and then lowering the administration set. Some patients will show some agitation. However, especially in sedated patients, this might not be possible to um, demonstrate. And so all of this is done to try to avoid patients coming in lame seven to 10 days later when our best treatment is sadly no longer going to be effective. Research on this topic is difficult even in human research um, and most of our guidelines are borrowed from human uh, practice. So in general, if you're suspicious or you're uh, certain of an extravasation, please stop the administration. Do not flush the cannula that's been used and draw around the affected area if you can see a swelling. Um, incrementally withdraw the cannula millimetre by millimetre, aspirating on use to try and um, take out as much of the extravasated material as possible. Have a moistened swab over the cannula as you withdraw to avoid flicking any elements of chemotherapy around the room.
if any blebs remain after withdrawal of the cannula, these can be transcutaneously aspirated using an insulin syringe every any syringe every time to try and minimise the amount of chemotherapy which remains inside the patient. Beyond this general advice for irritants such as vincristine, um, generally we recommend warm compresses uh, a few times a day, possibly with the injection of hyaluronidase to try and dissipate the material um, and also uh, DMSO to try and um, dissipate and dissolve the um, extravasated material. For uh, severe vesicles such as the anthracyclines, um, usually we advise cold compressors rather than warm compressors and we expect open wound management to become necessary, perhaps even amputation, unless there's prompt use of desrosoxane. Typically, we use desrosoxane or DMSO um, post anthracycline extravasation and not the two together. So again, um, research is a bit patchy and somewhat unethical to conduct, um, but we know from human research that giving three doses of desrosoxane seems to be the best treatment uh, possible. Um, and this is best given within, or the first dose rather, is best given within 30 to 60 minutes of the extravasation event. Um, with a dose of 10 times the dose of desrosoxane um, compared to the milligram dose of chemotherapy already administered and extravasated. Desrosoxane is also a uh, vesicant, and so if your nerves are already shattered um, or you're having a bad vein day, clearly it may be better to ask a colleague to administer this vesicant against um, the extravasation. And then um, it's given three times. Some um, authors quote that it should be given three times over three days, but most authors suggest it should be given three times over one day. Um, I personally have seen the aftermath of a, a doxorubes and extravasation, which is probably due to the patient changing position in a cannula that was only slightly in the vein rather than being very um, deeply buried into the vein. Um, and that patient had no external wound, um, had a little fibrous um, scar developed above the um, uh, extravasation site and um, kept the leg. So um, I've only had one uh, case of experience, but I was very impressed with the effect of uh, prompt and repeated desrosoxane. Finally, in this presentation, I wanted to more acknowledge rather than include effusions um, as emergency presentations in our patients because unlike, say, stabilization of a hypercalcemia patient while reaching a diagnosis um, definitively and then maintaining the sensitivity of treatment thereafter, which is a bit of a balancing act, the standard approach to diagnosing effusions often doesn't have such conflicts and so can proceed as standard, really. As um, we all know, there are several differential diagnoses which can underlie effusions, including hemangiosarcoma, chemodectoma, lymphoma, mesothelioma, carcinoma, maybe with dissemination into the cavity, um, such as carcinomatosis or sarcomatosis. When effusion becomes recurrent, um, it may be useful to place a pleural or peritoneal port, um, which also has the added, added benefit of facilitating intracavitary chemotherapy administration, which delivers hundreds to thousands of times the concentration to the lining of the peritoneum or the pleura, um, perhaps where the greatest burden of tumor cells is for greater anti-effusion effect. And we're having more and more evidence um, accrue for the use of agents such as tranexamic acid, genome bio and immunity, um, mushroom-based uh, uh, treatment for bloody effusions. So um, I'm just at the limits of my uh, presentation time, so I'd like to thank you for your attention and hopefully um, we'll be able to um, go to a bit of a live link with me um, for any questions or comments that you may have. Um, if you have got any um, queries um, or you'd like to have a discussion about a case before referral, then do get in contact either through our uh, reception on the email or give us a ring and we can have a chat in person. Thanks very much and have a good evening.